And, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to talk about the work. I'm really sorry the voice is a bit gone, so if you can't hear me, can you just tell me, or maybe there are a few seats closer, and uh, I will speak uh, <coughs> in a loud voice. So it's um, it's a kind of like side project that I started doing on the jump of uh, on the jump of the invasive plants. I got really interested by the concept of native and and invasive. And uh, I was reading a lot in the, in the papers about these invasive insects, which became a very strong narrative uh, in like around 2007, 8. And I decided to do a little side project, thinking, OK, I'm going to choose some insects that are relevant to what I want to say, and then get to photograph them. But of course, it, as a side project, it grew and became that massive thing, a void and subject that really totally engulfed me because it's you can't the uh, insect realm is such a complex one and in my childhood I was never really into insects it's something that came through that project but I must say now I can't really walk without noticing insects everywhere and really getting fascinated by them so I decided to find a few <coughs> make a list so the easiest point of entry was um, there's a sort of Europe I mean there is a European list of all the invasive insects and um, which I'm going to talk about, and then the, the find specialists, so an entomologist for each of the insects, which I narrowed the list to 12 insects that pose different kind of issues, but very quickly after meeting two or three specialists, and mm -hmm. I met the French specialist of one insect each time, which didn't know much about the other problematic, but though at some point they all kind of wrapped together. And I photographed the insect and did long interviews. So the project is meant to be a book where the interview actually, w they kind of crisscross the same uh, problematic and they create a very network of meaning and uh, ideas which really work. So um, I'm going to talk how the project grew and what it kind of brought as um, as narratives because I was interested to understand the whole problematic of like invasive insect not through the press not through ca catastrophism or other theories like collapsism which is quite big now but from the story of the insect so their bi biography and I was interested to understand what do insects say about the world uh, we live in and the world we share with them I mean we all have a connection with insects um, personal stories as well and also, they're very particular about the Anthropocene, that era uh, which we are now part of, which means that the environment is like directly modified by human action. And insects also reflect the fact that they were moved to some places and arrived in some places. So insects are used as markers of the Anthropocene, and the Anthropocene has different markers. Global <coughs> warming is just one. And... Um, I was really intrigued to read, and it really crossed with something I, I really quite like, the sort of like very peculiar entanglement of damage, damage ecosystem, <coughs> and how insects are able to adapt, because this is what they've been doing, you know, in a sort of Darwinian uh, vision of things. They really easily adapt to system, the ecosystem they're not really or originally from. And I was really particularly interested by some insect, like the tiger mosquito, which arrived in Britain, so all the insects are now in France, and it means they tend to go up north and east. So some I'm going to mention are not yet in Britain, and some probably won't because it depends on the on the trees they eat from, like the philophage, like some some trees don't really figure here, but there are some that are meant to come here in probably a couple of years. Now there's more awareness, but when the French started to really grasp the extension of the problem, there was read re the beginning. So Britain is after, so it means like the awareness is here. So like the tiger mosquito have elected their home in dumping site where old tires collect a little pool of water. And the anapoflora, which I'm going to show you and speak more about, which is not in Britain yet, it travels the world through uh, wood pallets, which transport the goods. So they're using all kinds of means to come and travel and go everywhere. And the media-friendly story of the critical disappearance of bees reminds us of fragile ecosystem and damaged equilibrium where insects play an important role for which they are really acknowledged. Uh, I wanted to 
bring into the journey the, the, the story. I mean, I wanted to talk about the journey I took also about getting to know more and more insects and getting the huge complexity of what they mean. So to start with, it's kind of like the, one of the points of entry was actually there's a La Fontaine uh, in the 17th century. He's a, a writer and he wrote these fables that are very well known. And here is the grasshopper and the ant. And he, uses, he used at the time a lot of animal, but also a massive amount of different insects to kind of command on the society of his time and to have a sort of like moral comment on the, the dysfunctional element. And I thought that was interesting that animals had often been used to kind of talk about the contemporary era and contemporary time. And insects do that in a way from the series that I grasped. But there was also a lot of moments where insects really, and it comes from also the long tradition of literature, of Kafka and other writers who use the insect to kind of encapsulate uh, our deepest fear and also our deepest notion of uh, who, who we are, you know, the humanity or the inhumanity in us. And uh, this film, which I thank John because I remember watching it with him, is called uh, Them. It's a very interesting film. Some of you might know it. It's like this giant ant, and it connects to my main topic with nuclear studies and nuclear culture because it's somewhere in, in America, in the desert, where the nuclear tests were uh, conducted. And as a side effect of the nuclear testing, the ants grew and start to turn against the human and attack them. And they have, it's a very Hollywood movie, so it's really about how to kill them. And of course, they destroy a lot of things. So that fear of the insect and the horror movie and the horror story and the sort of speculative science fiction vision that they might actually invade us, crawl on us, and destroy us is still always at the background of what we think when we are uh, among them. And all of us, uh, and you all have stories about that, we all have stories with insects and how you know, we hate mosquitoes and how you know, we kill them. So it's something quite personal. And I, I must say that when I started the project, I didn't really kind of had much interest really in them. I thought it was more the, me the kind of metaphor and uh, the bigger narration. But the more I grew into photographing them, because photographing them was the very, the very tough part of it, I grew really interested in them. And uh, they are very, they're posing a lot of like issues. So I, there was always sort of like as well that, that element of the media and the way media use insects. I mean, I just took these two examples from the Daily Mail. And uh, they are just the epitome of like a massive amount of like um, talk all or all through media, more and more about the invasive insects. And um, in this Daily Mail, it's really Daily Mail title, and they, they're talking about the killer hornet, which is Asiatic hornet, or the name, which has arrived and which um, is accused to kill, I mean, slaughter 50 bees a day. I would totally doubt about that, but it has been attacking uh, native bees and uh, other more kind of like vague world insects could be wiped out within a century, a scientific one. They are dying at eight times faster than mammals. Uh, it's also about how to apprehend the complexity of the problem. It's a very complex, intertwined, entangled because it's about like living ecosystems that vary, change, and evaluate all the time. So these titles are very quite simplistic and limitative, but though they speak about a real problem. And uh, one of the things that I really was interested in, it's, um, it's a very, very costly problem. That's why also we talk more and more about it. And <clears throat> there was a first evaluation recently about how much it cost, uh, the invasive insect, on the world, on the, in the world. And the number is really stunning. It's $70 billion a year to actually control and monitor invasive insects and the, and the consequence and the damage they cause. So that number, which I will come back to, was for me something quite uh, strange because they are the ones we don't really see. They are Some are kind of invisible and we don't know all of them and how can, can these numbers uh, happen. So to do so, to really investigate the invasive insects, I had to go into labs. <clears throat> and the first lab worked a bit different to go to because 
they were very suspicious of journalists, and this is the reason why. <laughs> like when I phoned and I said I was a journalist, like a few of them really kind of took the phone, banged it down, they didn't want to talk to me, literally, and I understand because this is really like not you know, creating more narratives that are very complex to handle. <clears throat> But then I got a few who agreed to talk to me, and I spoke particularly to Franck Courchamp, who I'm going to quote. And he's an he's a, uh, ecosystem specialist, and his understanding is much broader than every entomologist I met who had like a knowledge about one single insect. And the whole problematic is the, this is <coughs> they don't have a, an overall view, and the overall view is getting very difficult. And this is the problem also to talk about this problem. They have like their specificities and they require a lot of kind of knowledge. So I went to different places. It meant like traveling all over, all over France, Montpellier, Avignon, Versailles, Toulouse, an American lab in Montpellier as well, where you have to have like a, an ID check. You need to be vetted to go in. And I will show you image as well. You need to carry it to wear proper gear. I mean, it's because they're very scared of... A, taking the eggs out of that insect, which is breeding there and studying. And uh, meeting, it meant meeting a lot of people as well. This is the, the, the guy I'm mentioning from Courchamp, because insects have always, invasive plants and invasive insects, have already been here, I mean, since uh, travelers and the, the trade happened. There's never, you know, there's not a notion of native insect or native plant. They've already been introduced or naturalized or brought in the 18th century and 19th century were the very, very big, big time. But what they've noticed, which is really part of um, uh, a very big problematic at the moment, is like, and I will just maybe quote him and explain after, we need to keep in mind that the 10% rule among introduced species 10% will survive and acclimate to a new country. Among those 10, again, 10% will be invasive. So it's a very tiny proportion. The others will pacifically, pacifically leave and acclimate or hardly manage by. It takes 50 years between a new species introduction and its known impact. What we go through at the moment is the result of World War II. So the slow development of their spreading takes time to really become visible. Therefore, the kind of lack of reactivity when it comes to understanding what's going on, because they might have been here for a long time. Um, and uh, these insects are also, and this is the big problematic, instead, normally, all these insects that arrive through our time, uh, they kind of like, the, the progression, the curve of invasion normally gets done. Like, the 50 years pass from the Second World War, so the curve should decrease. But the, all the specialists were very surprised actually to find out that instead of falling down, the curve is actually exponential because there are more and more insects coming and there are very specific reasons why and they can't see really when it would actually go down. And that's when it's becoming very problematic because of course they interact with each other and create other kind of... Uh, condition of uh, exchange, which are also problematic. I was really surprised uh, as well to realize that no one, no one questioned uh, the, no, the word, the lexicon, like alien, invasive, invasion, native and local, except one specialist entomology. No one had a kind of like mm. second view on the, on the term, which is very charged, which also plays to what the papers can use, you know, in terms of like speaking about other problematic to do with Europe in, in, that, in that language. And I uh, recently read this week that because of the European election and the green agenda, which and, uh, uh, is becoming more and more popular in different countries, like in Hungary, Orban, uh, the president, decided to develop a green agenda, but not on green issues like you would imagine, like CO2, but on invasive insects. So totally playing in, within his <laughs> politics, the idea of invasive insects. So they're really interested the way they can be used uh, in different perspectives. So the idea of a local, or what they say, exogenous for outside, endogenous for inside, uh, it doesn't really work. I mean, these terms are, are really not operative anymore because of that globalization that's been going on. 
and uh, the idea of the polarization of native and external or alien also is a very complex term to kind of keep in mind. Um, there's nothing new about plants, animal and insect. Uh, they've always always been like part of like the environment. Insects are, were introduced as soon as human traveled, traded and fought. I mean, the war are very particularly element and time. And entomology called history has researched several introduction peaks. And I was talking about the Second World War, but the 16th century <coughs> was a major peak as well. Uh, as a consequence of the new world discovery. And that current peak that is not going down is getting very problematic. As such, insects have become markers of the Anthropocene. Uh, among nuclear fallout, CO2 released in the atmosphere. And the major difference, though, is that the predictive curve, which I was talking about, instead of getting down, is not getting down. So for the first time, and uh, that's a major article that Franck Courchamp uh, participated to, that's a sort of benchmark of like the current research. It was published in Nature, and uh, it's, the title is quite uh, great, and that's where, where I picked up the $70 billion. So that's the title, Massive Yet Grossly Underestimated Global Cost of Asian Insects. And it's the first thorough um, analysis of the situation. So for the first time they could put a, a, a number on it. And they also <coughs> did something very interesting. They took the top 10 insects and gave them a, a cost. So insects are also valued by how much damage they, they create, each of them. So there's number one, there's a less red list. And depending on uh, how many, how much money they uh, yeah, damage, like they would be rated and it would change. Uh, so the cost is colossal, 70 billion, of which 6.9 billion a year are directed towards health. Uh, the article is getting, actually pointing three main causes of uh, the increase. The global warming as a consequence of climate change, rising human population densities and intensifying <coughs> international trade will allow these costly insects to sp spread into new areas. So these are the three main causes they identified for the spread. And because we're not far away from any lowering down of the international trade, they are expecting many more insects to arrive. I got also intrigued by another, so they are conflicting views and articles. I got intrigued by another article, which was produced about the same time as the Nature article, and it was like from German scientist, which realized that more than 75% decline over the 27 years in total flying insect biomass in protected areas. So on one hand you have like decline, massive decline of insects, and on the other hand you have like an introduction and invasion of other insects. And how this is how it's totally redefining the insect population and affecting directly nature, ecosystem and also human. So this research both article led me to investigate the red list of uh, invasive insects conceived by the um, International Union of Conservation of Nature, which brought me to the European Union list of alien species, which is online, you can find listed which one are already in Europe. And um, I had to start the study somewhere, so I use French, France, I'm French, but that's not the only reason I could have started somewhere else. But France has a peculiar logic to start the research uh, over there. And this is from, from Courchamp again. Um, he said it's peculiar because it's surrounded by three seas. It's at the center, geographically and economically. There are more tourists per year than French inhabitants. Commercially, it is one of the major European countries and it has different climates. So it's a very ideal point to study the invasion. Doesn't mean that they are, of course, arriving through Italy and Spain, because they mainly arrive from the south. But France has a, an interesting combination in terms of weather and climate. And what we see is like most of the insects I'm going to talk are getting from the south to the north, and therefore, of course, they don't know any border, so they will go anywhere after. So I, um, So my first move was to 
reconsider a form of narrative, a biography for each of the chosen insects. And in doing so, I was intrigued by the forensic analysis of entomologists who retraced the arrival of each of these invasive insects, sometimes with very uh, acute precision. And uh, I like to use the case of the Asiatic hornet, which you probably have already. Um, so I'm entering now in the photographic series. Uh, you probably, it is in Britain already, but it's not massively um, spread. In France, it's like a major problem. Uh, every summer, the newspaper would just talk about <coughs> that. And um, it's also a very intriguing insect. Uh, it's bigger, it's easy to spot if you see a hornet and if you know a little bit, it's slightly bigger. But it's uh, much more kind of aggressive, not in, not in terms of attacking human. No one has proven, even though the press or people really hate them, but it's not been proven that they do attack human more. Uh, but they do attack local bees, and that's true. And they, they pose a lot of like, um, uh, which has quite consequence because bees are also in a very weak shape at the moment with the disease that they have. So they're really playing in that narrative. But then, because in the natural world everything is complex, I was also given a very interesting interpretation of the reason why they attack bees. It's because a lot of like um, people who start doing beekeeping, uh, they have the choice between when they buy their bee to uh, start the beekeeping pro project, they use a, a certain bee which has been kind of, um, uh, which is much more docile and very easy, you know, they don't sting so much, the, the human who did <coughs> them. And these bees are, of course, less robust. So less robust than other native bees or wild bees. So when the Asiatic hornet arrives in that specific kind of dimension of a lot of beekeeping by amateur, it's really a sort of element of devastation because they can, they can be really, really powerful. So it has a very interesting story, that hornet. It came with one single female. So from one single female, they call, her, they call her the founding female. And uh, it arrived in France, in the, they followed, because they, they kind of like, it spread progressively, and they followed through DNA, they all do like DNA uh, analysis, and they realized that it had arrived through the harbor of Bordeaux. And it was coming in a shipment of ceramic pots from uh, central China. So they knew exactly where the bee came in China, then it arrived in Bordeaux, stayed in the harbor for a few weeks, and it was, um, it went to a um, green shop, you know, selling plants, plant shop, and that's from there that it flew, laid eggs, and created the invasion. So one was enough uh, at the time to create the invasion. So that female hornet, and that was in uh, 2004. In 2005, Following the same DNA tracking, it was identified in Iraq, and then it spread all over Europe. It's been localized in Spain in 2010, in Portugal 2011, and the evasion is now well documented because of the DNA matching and the maps they have produced. So from that, they work out mapping, uh, and it goes a lot through also amateur entomologists or people who are really into insects because there's a lot of knowledge, people have massive amount of knowledge about insects, so they would spot something and phone their local phone and contact and you can say I've seen this insect and from then they can draw more accurate maps. So that's the beginning, Bordeaux, then Nerac and then it's all over and it's really problematic now. The Vespa velutina, which is the scientific name of the Asiatic hornet, it's very interesting as well, because what it does and what they've studied is like it likes human. So instead of doing nests in the countryside like probably more, more native hornet do, it goes and makes nests near a commercial um, supermarket or parking, parking lot. So it has sort of like different behavior and also attaching itself uh, to human. And um, yeah, warehouses. And it follows trade commercial routes mainly with Asia. <coughs> which is the one biggest trading partner of, of Europe. So this second animal, Foracantas and Punctata, is not in Britain, and it probably won't be. It's um, attaching itself to, it's not listed in the, in the red list, it's not a very problematic one, and I went to photograph it near Toulouse. It comes from Australia, 
and uh, it likes eucalyptus. So it's very specific and therefore it's specific to this type of trees only. And also its way of damaging the tree is kind of very, so very mellow. It only attacks, I don't know, maybe destroy, eats from trees that are already weak and damaged. So in the realm of invasive insects, they have different adaptation ability and also the consequence would be very different. But what it takes, what it tells the story of uh, the Farconta is quite interesting because they don't totally know uh, when it arrived because it doesn't, it's not on the same scale as the hornet and it's very localized. But what it shows is like the route it followed from Australia tends to follow war zone. And it's very interesting as well that I thought not just commercial trade or globalized trade mainly with Asia, but that one was spotted in war zone in a follow-up of historical story. It's now in the southwest and it, it informs us on military movement of troops and ammunition. And uh, it's called the eucalyptus borer in, in English. It's originally from Australia, it's collectarian. And uh, it's very deteriorated as, as it can really follow different paths and it was spotted in South Africa and then in Lebanon, in Libya and then in, in France. So they, they realized that it had something to do probably with um, box cases or casing. I mean, they, for that one, depending also on the way the lab are funded and the research is funded, there's also the knowledge is not the same. And for insects, it's like, it takes a very long time to kind of gather very exhaustive knowledge. So I was much more interested by that one. It's, it's been seen in, in Britain and it's, uh, that one is not very good news. It's definitely on the red list. It's called um, the palm tree beetle. And they, I think they spotted it in uh, Cornwall uh, a few years ago. And that one is very interesting because it speaks of colonial, how colonial history and also the way we kind of redesign our landscape after the 18th and 19th century by importing a lot of the colonial image, it, um, it destroys palm trees. I mean, and now it's uh, all over the Mediterranean. And in France, it's causing a huge amount of uh, problem because some cities like Nice <coughs> and uh, other cities on the French Riviera uh, have defined their image with the sea and the palm trees. And that insect is able of destroying uh, palm trees at a, a high speed. It's a very, very um, lively insect. So the snout beetle, that's how it's called, it, it arrived in 2006 in France. And there are two versions of the same, of the story. How did it get in and, and why? And on that one, it poses a lot of like, Interesting, that sit as a larvae, so of course because they are, so it's a very big uh, insect um, and quite, quite attaching, it's very beautiful, I mean, the color and vividness, so that sit before it morphs into what we've seen after, uh, what we've seen. So, to talk about it, and to talk about what it does, uh, it's a very robust one, it can fly 50 kilometers in one go, and uh, therefore spread, and it uses pheromone. So I met the, the entomologist that isolated its pheromone, and it's um, not very easy. There's no product pesticide to get rid of it, and pesticides are not really invited anyway. People don't really want because it's the palm trees are mainly in cities, so there's no way to use that. But the way it entered is um, a complicated story, and that story was given to me by Didier Rochard. In Versailles. So I will read that because it kind of poses also complicated status between European collaboration and also things that are kind of like, because they really cost a lot of money, so they tend not to speak all the time. We understand that the insect arrived with an important lot of palm trees which had a stamp certificate of European trade emanating either from Spain or Italy and should have guaranteed it was clear of insects. Within Europe, there is no security constraint, and back then there was no qualification of quarantine organism of mandatory er eradication. We therefore considered that our neighbors already hosted invasive insects. In Europe, the first encounter 
with a palm tree happened in the south of Spain, 94, 95, and the most plausible hypothesis is that it was introduced from the Middle East ahead of the Universal Exhibition in Seville in 1992, with extensive palm trees in port. In Spain, a few years before the financial crisis, or 2008, there were a lot of property development projects, mainly along the coast, and it was necessary to create new urban landscape. It can be easily planted in the palm tree and transplanted to create an exotic landscape. Uh, we all like to have the tropics. Well, from the prediction of the entomologist, Didier Rocha, who is a French specialist, palm trees might disappear in the 20 years to come. And um, the only thing to do would be to cut the palm trees that are affected, but in the place where they are, which is mostly around this sort of like beautiful Riviera town, the town hall don't want to destroy the trees. Therefore, they try to treat them, which is not really possible. And the insect flies from tree to tree, 50 kilometers, dealing on the pheromones, so they recognize each other through the smell and gather, create new cluster. Normally, they would not have been able to pass certain climate, uh, some, some hard winters. But because of global, wa global warming, what happened, the palm trees, just palm tree, but it's not a tree proper. Inside, there's a lot of water. And um, the winters are getting shorter. They're not really cold anymore. So the palm tree that nests in the, inside the core of the, the head of the palm tree, because of the water quality of the palm tree, the, the water keeps sort of like warm enough for them to manage to live uh, the whole winter. And then spring comes and they manage to, so they're not dying as they had expected, they would die. And therefore they're able to go further north and north and having been seen in Cornwall. So they are very, problematic for the people. The only way is to cut the tree but, and after to destroy it in a very specific way, but that's very pricey. So a lot of people, when the tree is affected, cut it, get a cheap company to dispose of the wood, the wood is dumped and then the, the, the eggs are not killed. So it needs a containment which is very complex and the only place in Europe where it has been contained, it's in um, some islands uh, of Spain where they have local native palm trees and the population was very aware of these animals and you can actually see signs in the palm trees, it's in the Canaries island. So if population is aware, if people look at the palm tree, they can really see signs of like the tree being ill and it would be a way to kind of like control and have a whole system around it. But most of the towns don't want to spend money on, on staff looking after the trees and looking for signs. So therefore, the animal can uh, spread. That's the, of the 12 animals I, I um, of the 12 animals I photographed, there's one which I still have not managed to catch properly. And it's this um, ant coming from Argentina. And I mean, that's the proper picture of it. So I have a friend, James Haig, who did some uh, woodwork prints. Uh, and the ant is very, um, is spreading. I think it's in <coughs> Britain now. They are the biggest uh, sort of like system, living system, so colonies. And they are on top of that list that I was mentioning because they are able to destroy birds in nests, uh, little chicks, all kind of animal, and again, they attach themselves to humans, so they would live in a campsite, houses, so they, they don't really, they go in cities where they can find food and, uh, and develop, so this one I will need to go back and photograph, so that one is in a lab in, a, in X. How big is that one? <laughs> uh, uh, the Petri dish gives you a bit of an idea, so it's a uh, two millimeter. Small, yeah, yeah, it's very small. Yeah. Though among all the insects of the list, it's the most dangerous one, and it's really uh, it's it has a <laughs> very like uh, aggressive um, sort of behavior, uh, which I'm going to talk about. So when when I spoke to the um, to the scientist, uh, they were doing, and actually they did that with the end. They were doing. Um, 
speculative prediction because like that's the only way once a, an insect is arrived there's no way you can really stop it like the uh, the weevil can't be stopped it's too late and i'm going to talk about the boxwood the boxwood moth which is in britain i think is quite already spread is very hard to contain so they're now trying to predict which one are going to arrive and um to do that, they work on um, algorithm and mathematic formula. And they did that with, the, um, with these ants. And this is when the uh, Argentinian ant came up. So they took a whole year. They had a lot of um, funding for the lab. And they did sort of like war scenario. They put different ants, different type of ants together to see which one would destroy each other. And by elimination, they worked out which one was the strongest. And this one actually destroyed all the other ants, native and other invasive. But that scenario of predict predictive um, uh, kind of yeah, speculative predictive test also allowed to eliminate one ant which had been part of the uh, trial, the protocol, and which was there by mistake. So in a way they proved, they found out who was the most aggressive one but also managed to kind of like take one out of their uh, equation. I will um, speak about yeah, the sort of like bio-war, because the, I'm more talking about accidental introduction, the one like the hornet, but they do introduce a lot of um, insects, and they use them more and more because people have turned against uh, <coughs> pesticide in agribusiness. And the insects are really perfect to do the work, so they're becoming actually tools, uh, I mean, bio-tools for us. And um, there was one problem mainly with the apple tree production, and um, apples are the most uh, polluted fruit because they need to get rid of uh, larvae, which is, has been in the apple trees and apples for, since the 19th century, so a very spread problem in Europe, in Chile, in America, where a lot of apples are produced. But then they realized, so it really cost a lot for uh, agro-apple business. And um, they, this is um, a lab in Nice, and they did something quite amazing with that uh, wasp. It's a parasitoid wasp. And it was introduced for the first time voluntarily by scientists in the Drôme area in France, in the south. Uh, they are testing uh, its ability to, I mean, to survive, to be introduced in nature. This is one that is bred in, they, they breed a lot of insects in labs. And it's going to attack the eggs of that parasite that is damaging the apple. But to find the wasp, because the wasp is not from Europe, they kind of thought what could regulate uh, the, the parasite in the, in the apple. And they went back to the origin of the geographical origin of the apple tree. And it's China and Kazakhstan. And they went to Kazakhstan and they realized that in Kazakhstan they didn't have that, parasitoid, uh, that parasite problem. Because in Kazakhstan there is that little wasp and the wasp attacks the eggs of the parasite. So they decided to import that wasp, grew it and release it. But when they did that last year in France, and they did a few years ago in Chile and a few years ago before in California, uh, they had the previous experience of introducing uh, the ladybird, which they did in the early 20th, 21st century uh, to control the green fly in the hop culture. And the scientists were very lax. I mean, they introduced it thinking it would die because they wouldn't survive the winter, but the ladybird did survive the winter. So there was a counterexample of how an, an introduction, voluntary introduction, could, could turn into a nightmare. So now to introduce a new insect in a, in a, in a geographical territory, it requires years of uh, red tape and admin paper and research. So that could only happen in France. It's been successful in California and in, um, <coughs> in Chile. So they bred the wasp, and they, it's a heteropter, heteropterian, and they introduced it for the first time. And they will look at how it's managing. So one year would not be enough. This trial will take years, because there are so many elements they cannot predict when they are not in the lab. 
So this one is, is a tiny wasp. It's really, a, I will show more image if you want. It's very, maybe five millimeter. And it's kind of a very beautiful animal, Namastrus redens. So to the, the case of one that is not very well liked, so this is in a way a positive introduction, positive invasive. And that's the specialist, Xavier Fauverg, in uh, his lab and breeding. So all the wasps are in these boxes. And that was a few months before they were released uh, in, uh, in the room. And that one, maybe you would, you've probably heard of it, is the tiger mosquito. And that's not really a very good news. So it's responsible for that number I gave you, the $70 billion. Um, this one. Uh, Tiger mosquito Aedes albopictus is responsible for 84%, uh, well, no, of the $6.9 billion which are devoted to health. This, the containment, uh, the whole program of our education is uh, taking 84% of the total cost uh, for the health issue. So its destruction has been evaluated at $8 billion a year. And um, the dipteran is present in the south of France, I mean, massively present now, so you can see them all over. The lab where I went is Montpellier, but there were a lot of them. And uh, it's originally from, um, it's, it carries a lot of diseases that are problematic, like not so much Mariah, but Zinka. And, um, and, and it's really... Zika. Zika, yeah. Zika disease. Mm -hmm. And um, another one, Chikungunya. So they are really uh, like not so easy to yeah happen because these diseases are really problematic now. They realize as well their way of moving is very intriguing. Um, they realize that because they're mainly in the south, they do sort of like um, hitchhiking in a way. They get in the car at uh, on the motorway when people stop by to. Uh, pay, you know, the, 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 mot the motorway uh, system. They get in the car and they get out where you stop. So that was their way of spreading. So they're very um, pragmatic in a way. <laughs> and uh, they can go anywhere through our system of like moving around. So you can take one in a bag and, and bring. And um, I uh, saw a few in the Paris tube. And people are quite aware of them. Yeah? <laughs> so like people start looking. Someone said there's a tiger and people kill it. In, in the Montpellier, it's really making a very bizarre... <laughs> There's a lot of a new business that is arising because, of course, they are very... They don't wait for the evening to come out and they really like staying... They, they really bite it very badly. But then um, one way of getting rid of it is to produce this carbon. So you release sort of like carbon around your house or around uh, in your garden and uh, you can manage to kind of contain them. So there's a new business that was created in so uh, a very opportunist business to kind of like contain their, their growth. And the French, especially in the South, are really attached to one of the things and they were really totally hungry with that insect. It's like they can't have an aperitif outside <laughs> at six o'clock because they are attacked. So it really like for them was a major issue. So they can't use pesticides, as I told you, less and less pesticides are used. So for this one, they are developing a new pro... I mean, it's, it's been used in the, in the 60s, but it was kind of abandoned, and it's coming back because of how, problem, well, how public opinion again, uh, against chemical. They use the male, um, and they use uh, uh, atomic um, medicine, in a way, uh, nuclear, nuclear medicine, to render them sterile. And they release, so they're bred in lab, they're sterile, sterile, sterile males that are released all over. And uh, they fertilize the female, but because they're sterile, they're not like... And they expect, I mean, they made some mathematic, mathematical formula that at some point, by that depletion of male uh, fertilizing female, it should come to a point where it would be manageable. They would never, of course, disappear. So that's the new way to kind of like approach the problem which, in which they think is a cleaner way. But uh, yeah, it's discutable. So it's this sort of like biotechnical, it's a very biotechnical <coughs> world now. And um, it's really defined by the scientific labs, which are under pressure by the agribusiness, pharmaceutical and pharmachemical consortium. 
and government policies. Um, and now it's really complex also to approach a problem away from science. And that this fly, Suzuki, is also very interesting because it's the only time when I met an entomologist that actually had a very quite different discourse from the dominant scientist discourse. So this fly, Suzuki, it's not in, in Britain, it attacks uh, cherry trees mainly. And it's a drosophile. I mean, you know the vinegar fly, it's very similar. So it's a tiny, tiny fly you have in your kitchen when you have like rotten fruits. But the difference between this and the normal, I mean, the average um, drosophile, it doesn't attack uh, fruit when they are rotting, but before they do rot. So it's very problematic because the cherry, tr the cherry's production it has a very narrow time gap about production. It's a very fragile economy. You have to really work maybe throughout a few weeks and then it's finished for the year. And they, so they have been damaging and causing a lot of problems. And they realized very recently, like this last year, that they move now and uh, seem to be interested. So far they weren't too cherries, but they're interested in grape. And that's very big, I mean, very big for them with the flag. So they spotted them around Bordeaux. And uh, they're interested in peach, but maybe yeah, in the wine yards, vineyards. So the first, when I spoke to the specialist of that um, insect, which is Simo Pelou, he said something very interesting, because he said, well, there's no way you can use pesticide. The cherry will be eaten. It's very fragile fruit. You can't like, spray it like maybe apple. You, could, you can or you could. So he said the only way is to work with nests. So you put specific nests, but the nests are not very pleasing visually. So also in that landscape. So people don't really want to use nests. And he said the easiest way actually is to use human. Because it's very easy, again, in those lot of problematic I've been talking, the human eye is actually the one that can understand and read the sign in the tree or the fruit. But the problem with using human is like has a huge cost, which the agribusiness agri is not ready to, to put on the table. So there's that debate at the moment, which is a very interesting point, because the farmers don't want to use pesticide because it has a bad image now. So they want to move on to a new solution, which they ask the scientists to. And the scientists, in the case of the cherry, tell them, well, it's about uh, human labor. You need to pay more people. And for them, because it's a very fragile industry, it's also very problematic. So it's what he said it was to really come back to something quite simple, in a way, to have like human attention and human tending to, to the trees. And of course it would have a cost, which um, is very problematic at the moment to introduce when we, find, when we talk about solution. So the Suzuki is uh, spreading, and uh, I think when it hits Bordeaux and the wine, I think they probably would be more motivated than by cherry. I mean, that's, what, that's a quote from Simon Fellou. I think it's good to hear how he speaks about that. Suzuki is a problem and not a problem. The cherry picking industry is a, is a niche production. Suzuki therefore questions modes of production and production costs. Eradicating it from one parcel does not solve the problem. It flies. It's a global issue that needs to be addressed through diversity of approach. What Suzuki requires is manpower. People who check the trees and if necessary destroy some infested harvest. The whole production needs to be rethought. The agriculture sector partitioning most of the finance, the domination, the dominance of monoculture, workers' rate, the technologies can, we can use are very low-tech, human surveillance and less. And um, from, when I'm getting finished with the, the talk, what I encountered actually was really a lot of puzzlement and uncertainties and kind of, of the science. And um, it seems that a very quite shifting time and moment as well, like scientific solution don't seem to bring what the scientists were used to. They would really, you know, the state would fund them to fund pro solution, and the solution now, not operative, most of the insects I mentioned, can't be eradicated through the usual old process. So there was a lot of perplexity and a lot of, like, doubts about what they were doing and also how they were doing it. And um, because I've shown you this macro, I wanted to show you that how, I mean, doing the macro... Photography was a whole issue, which I was not really aware of before I started. So this is, for example, one, um, we wanted to have an image of um, 
Suzuki biting, Suzuki mosquito biting the lab assistant. But then you can't allow the Suzuki fly to the Suzuki, um, no, it's not the Suzuki, it's the tiger mosquito, sorry. He couldn't escape, you know, this lab, <laughs> he can't have a mosquito flying around. So after we spend a lot of time trying to find the mosquito and, and, uh, and destroying it, actually, it was what I did, and that's kind of like really what came out of that project. To photograph, and that's a very important point for me, to photograph them, I had to actually embed myself in the scientific labs. And that's when we photographed the Alloploflora, that very beautiful um, one which I will show after. It's in the American lab in Montpellier. And um, Alloploflora is in quarantine, so we had to wash everything, clean the camera for a long time, like it's very, the white overalls were thrown, it's a very, very problematic insect if it escapes, and it's a very beautiful one as well. Yeah, it's, it's that one. So that's uh, one of the most, on that list I told you about. It's a uh, very, uh, it's the costliest of all my of older series, and it comes from Asia. And um, it's, uh, it's been spotted in Europe, in Germany, near, in Germany, near Munich in France, in Strasbourg, and somewhere in the south. And uh, each time they spot one, it's, there's a whole protocol going on. I mean, and this time, because it's so, it's, um, it, it's a philophage, so it would destroy any trees. It's not specific in terms of tree, like the other one, Eucalyptus borer. It would eat any tree, any leaves on any tree. So when they spot one, and they did a few times, and they, this is the one that comes in the wood pallet that we use to transport goods, so there are a lot now, much more attention in like big harbor, like Le Havre, Rotterdam. Now they have put in place a system of surveillance because that's the last, is the point of entry in Europe, but that's the last moment maybe where you can monitor them entering. And um, now they're much more aware of that. So it looks like they are kind of producing system of kind of containing them maybe in the harbor. But when it's spotted on a tree, and it has been spotted by amateur uh, insect people who spotted it. It's a very beautiful one, it's very big, so you see it very easily. They have to destroy the tree, but not only the tree, they do a five kilometer different circle of perimeter, and I think the first perimeter, three, uh, three meter, pardon, not, not kilometer, meter. Three meter, you destroy all the trees around, and there's another one, five, you monitor, and you have to monitor for years. So waiting to see if there were eggs somewhere stored somewhere. So I will finish with uh, this just image of like a world of insect that was really seen from the perspective of the of the scientist, the entomologist, and the lab. And uh, it of course has its own limit. It's a very contained world, whereas the world outside and how insects interf interact with us, with the ecosystem, is of course much more complex. So we'll finish with that. Okay, thanks, Agnes. Mm -hmm.